I found him on TikTok, and I think I've already mentioned this to the class. He does these really cool um, role plays. Of, and I, I, I'm literally like envisioning your front door because they're tip, at least the ones, the most of the videos that I've seen, he's like opening up his front door to his like apartment or his house. And the POV is like, you're the sun, right? <laughs> and that the sun is coming like, hey, and the sun struggles with addiction, right? In this like role play. And Eric, the dad is setting boundaries of like, hey, buddy, I know it's really cold out. But you know, mom and I have decided that we're going to set these boundaries. So it's really interesting how he's showing love and compassion to somebody who's struggling with addiction and at the same time holding these really strong boundaries. Um, so Eric is going to share his story, how we say in the program of strength and hope. And then, right. Yeah. And then at the end, again, through the let through the talk, if you have questions or comments, please throw them in the chat. And then at the end, we'll kind of open the forum up. Sounds good. Eric, the floor is yours, my friend. All right. Um, so I'll keep it more towards the addiction side of everything because that is what my my biggest passion is towards. But a little bit of my story is at 13, I was diagnosed with ADD. This is in the early 90s I got diagnosed. So it wasn't like nowadays where people get diagnosed ADHD and all that through telehealth and all of a sudden they have ADHD and all this wonderful stuff. I literally, my dad was a doctor. He was a uh, DO, doctor of osteopathy, a family practitioner, uh, had a family practice. And so I had to meet with a psychologist, a psychiatrist. I mean, I had to meet with like multiple people to get this diagnosis. They put me on Ritalin, noticed an instant difference, um, noticed that it slowed my brain down and all of that. Um, so that was my first diagnosis. Um, at 14, wanted to be cool, wanted to have fun. That's when I kind of started drinking. Um, didn't think anything of it because we're young, we're dumb. It's just a phase, continued drinking. Um, got into high school and started to experiment with smoking weed. Started doing, I did a lot of acid in high school. Um, did a lot of MDMA in high school. Um, did... Uh, Microdots, which is a form of LSD, did some cocaine, lots of drinking in high school, performed very well. I was actually, for whatever reason, fairly intelligent, graduated in the very top of my class. Um, at 17, I was re-diagnosed with ADHD and I was put on Adderall, which actually had a way better effect than what Ritalin did. It didn't drop me or anything like it did. Um, decided college wasn't really for me, went through that whole thing, ended up getting married at 19, got divorced at 23. And by that time I started to have a alcohol and a cocaine addiction issue. Um, I was drinking kind of every day, but it's just to take the edge off. I got into sales, became that I was very, very good at sales. I don't know why, but that was like, that was my thing with sales. Um, made really good money, put my first wife through. Uh, grad school, got her master's degree at um, San Diego State University. Thought I was on top of the world. We get divorced and started going through a divorce as she is graduating. And I didn't realize I had a lot of trauma um, throughout life that built up. And I don't think a lot of men do or women do. And I don't think trauma is, comes from necessarily a bad life. Uh, I had a lot of abandonment trauma. I didn't have a bad life. I mean, my dad was a very successful doctor. Money was never an issue, all of that. But also work overplaced everything. I don't, if people ask me like, hey, what events were you? My dad wasn't at events. My dad wasn't at things. You know, my mom was. Um, I know what it's like to be forgotten at a Kmart because they literally forgot me there. <laughs> so I didn't realize that these little things actually do fuck with your head later on in life. Um, and it builds this, this foundation, like these lies and truths that you build inside of you. So I'm going through a divorce now all of a sudden. And... I ended up using cocaine again, which was probably the worst time I could ever use cocaine because I'd used it in high school, but this time I was at such a low point in my life that this was amazing this time. And this was something that gave me big mood energy. It took away all my anxiety. It took away all my depression. It made me feel like I could take on the world. I mean, it made me feel fucking unstoppable. And it just worked hand in hand with my drinking. Um, and from 23 on, I... Um, I was an on and off trying to get sober, knew there was an issue, addict. Um, 
throughout that time, I became more and more successful at work and I literally blamed my success on my addiction. Uh, that's how bad of an addict and how most addicts, how we work is anything that is successful, anything that's amazing in life, we almost say, hey, it's because of our addiction. That's how much it lies to us mentally. This is how sick we actually get. And so I literally felt like, hey, to have successful days at work, I had to drink before work. I had to do coke before work. I had to, to do all this during this process. And during all this, I got diagnosed. 23, 23 I was diagnosed with uh, MDD, which is major depressive disorder. Um, later on, I got diagnosed with GAD, which was general anxiety disorder, which didn't make any sense until later on in life. Um, I got off a lot of my meds and stuff because I felt alcohol and cocaine kind of took care of it all for me and I didn't need those. And unfortunately, that stigma around meds is that people are always like, oh, dude, you don't need meds and, and that stuff's just bullshit. And you kind of buy into that and you're like, okay, well, yeah, I'll self-medicate then because I got to quiet my fucking brain down one way or another. So... Heavily addicted, but successful as hell at work. I mean, I'm, I, I, from 21 on, I'd never made under 130, 140 a year. Like, I'm, I'm, that was what I made. And I was just constantly making more money and, and running dealerships all of a sudden. Um, really good at what I did, but I was just, I literally, I worked and I'd go and get fucked up, black out, and wake up the next day and do it again. Um, I got married again at 20... Right around, what was I, I was 27, that got annulled. That was a mistake. Um, get married again. And this is where my life really started to go to hell, was I was already a functioning alcoholic and cocaine addict. And I meet my wife, and I love my wife. Her name is Brandy. Um, and her and I were both addicts, and we were both very toxic in that sense. We were very codependent. We were very enabling um, to the point that we end up getting married. We were married for four, total we were married for five years. Um, we were separated for about a year. Um, when we first got together, it was just with alcohol. We were just, we, we'd go through two 30 packs, three 30 packs a night. Um, we weren't drinking because it was fun to like to take off the edge. Like we'd literally, you, alcoholics drink for percentages. So it's like, okay, what has the highest alcohol percentage? What's going to get us fucked up the quickest? Got even worse, we would both be doing coke. We would go on benders together. Um, I mean, I know what it's like to have coke that's mixed with meth and her thinking that the cops are gonna break down the door. I'm literally running RV dealerships, calling in sick because my wife is a hand against the door swearing to God that fucking SWAT's gonna break down the door. And if she stands there, they're not gonna break down the door because they couldn't kill her. She's pissing herself on the floor because she won't go to the bathroom because if she leaves, the SWAT team's gonna break in looking out the window going, what the fuck are you looking at? I mean, that's, that's our life as addicts though. Um, finally got to the point that I realized that, you know, we were going to end up dying one way or another, um, especially because of how codependent we were with each other and enabling with each other. She ended up coming down with, um, Wernick signophropy, which is your thiamine depletes out of your brain. It is a side effect of drinking too much alcohol and not eating any food. Uh, so your brain starts to shut down um, and it, the symptoms and signs of it is a lot of like dementia. Like I would go to work and she would be like, where were you at? I was like, I was at work. She was like, do you, where do you work at? You know, like literally have no idea. And I'm just like, okay, something's not right. We get her through that. We relapse though. We start drinking again. We, uh, we separate. I take her back to her mom's in Yuma, Arizona. I'm in Orange County because it's a, and I told her it's the only way like we're going to live. Like we have to get sober. We're obviously not going to get sober together. And then, so we separate. I'm still functioning uh, coke addict and alcoholic, not really making any efforts to get sober. Um, but I was able to calm it down a little bit more. Um, and then 7 27 2015, I get a call from the Inuit County Sheriff's Department because my wife committed suicide. So she killed herself in a hotel room. She died by asphyxiation. Um, she was putting plastic bags over her head. Took her three attempts. Um, the reason I know it was three attempts is they, they require you, I was her husband still because we were legally married, we were just separated. Um, and so I had to go down to do everything. They won't show you the body or anything of that, but they'll go through you know the crime scene you know information with you. And, they had explained that they found two bags in the trash that she had ripped open from the back of her 
um, head and turned out that this is actually really common amongst women to die this way. Um, they found a liter of uh, vodka in the trash that was empty. That was all in her system. She did have benzos in her system. Um, really planned out suicide. Had suicide notes for me, had suicide notes for her mom, had suicide notes for God. Um, had literally Ziploc bagged up and put out the clothes that she wanted to be cremated in. Um, and I didn't know how to address that. My birthday, by the way, is August 17th, 2000, uh, or August 17th, 1980 is my birthday. So this is 10 days roughly after my birthday. Um, not sure how to process any of this. Um, I talked to my dad. My dad's a huge role model, a huge part of this. Fucks me up though. Don't know how to address it. Don't buy into this whole dude. If I don't acknowledge it, that's what that's what strength is. Just don't acknowledge it. It's okay. You know, not realizing like, hey, this really has just fucked you up. You really did love this person. You can be honest and you can be open about that. You can be mad about this. Like everything that takes place. And I ended up finding a lot of comfort in self medication and cocaine and in alcohol. And that shit went through the fucking roof. It went from doing a gram of Coke a week, two grams of Coke a week to doing an eight ball easy a day. And that's three and a half grams to two eight balls in a day, which is seven grams, seven and a half grams of cocaine, which is a lot of fucking Coke. Um, I would start drinking at about 7.30 in the morning. I would start off with a case of 99 bananas. It's 12 of those little shooters, um, 99 proof vodka essentially. And I would slam those on my way to work, almost pass out on the way to work, stop, get another fifth. And then I would stop before I'd go in and do a manager's meeting. And I would do five or six rails of cocaine in my truck. And this is a job, by the way, that I should be really appreciative of. They're paying me forty to $50,000 a fucking month. But I literally didn't care about any of this shit. Like, I was living a nightmare. Um, going through all of this, and that was my life for about two years. Um... I literally self-medicated every single day. I was cheating on my wife. I was trying to find anything and everything in life to fill this black hole and gap. Um, people knew I was an addict, but I was really good. We as addicts are good manipulators, liars, cheaters, steals. I mean, we are salesmen. If you ever meet a recovering addict, we are the most charismatic individuals. So imagine us when we want something and to manipulate something. It is fucking amazing. It is like, it's literally artwork. If you're sober and you are a recovering addict, and you watch another addict manipulate a family, it is literally like the most played out, just charismatic. You're like, holy fuck, dude, how the fuck did they pull that off? Because it, 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 you can't explain this charisma, this side of somebody that comes out and just wraps somebody around their fingers. So I finally get to the point where I lose that job. I've hit rock bottom. I decide to get sober. Um, I end up finding another job. And August 13, 2017, two years later, my dad commits suicide. And he kills himself in his car with a paring knife. Sliced his wrist, sliced his neck, put the knife in his chest. I mean, he wanted to die. He was a... That one I got to go through because I had to go through his car and pull out rings and stuff out of his pool of blood. Um, that one fucks you up. Learned I had PTSD and blood was the trigger it just kind of brings you to that whole like I could explain to people exactly where rings were I can explain the whole interior of the car like I cannot forget what it looks like to how it smells that iron smell kind of coppery fucking amazing how it burns this image in your head and um that was uh four days for what was it yeah, four days before my birthday so didn't realize all the compounding abandonment trauma and all the other issues and stuff that fucking went on um I was three weeks sober at that time um, because I decided I had to change something before all this. And I used a lot of anger and rage when I first got sober that I wasn't going to relapse just to fuck him over. Just like, fuck you. Because for the last, I was 36 at that time. So for the last like 13 years, I've been trying to get sober nonstop. Couldn't get sober. So I was like, fuck it. This time I'm going to make it stick. And it did stick. Unfortunately, there was a lot of therapy that was needed that I didn't realize until about five years sober of actually going into um, trauma therapy and dealing with trauma and learning self-worth and learning self-love and why do we self-sabotage and why do we destroy our lives constantly and why can you be sober but still have the same traits and all that amazingness. And 
I'd always found a joy in social media. It was an outlet for me to share. And I started sharing on TikTok and Twitter and I created a nonprofit and got really big into this for a while. It was like a huge passion of mine. And then kind of got over it, went through a whole cancel culture. I learned what that was all about and um, stepped away from social media for a long time. And I had a lot of people that will keep reaching out to me and going, dude, your content really helped. Please don't delete it or please do it still some. It's like, all right, so I did. And then I found a huge thing into it about a year ago where I really enjoy the addiction side of it a lot more um, because I like addicts because addicts were, were fucked up, man, and were, were real and were raw to other addicts. And addicts know when addicts are fucking with each other. Like, yeah, I, I do one-on-one -on -one mentorings, and the people that I have do these mentoring sessions, I have, uh, I have doctors, I have chiropractors, I have uh, lawyers, I have judges. Um, I have a lot of people who actually will do these because they're like, dude, I relate to your story and people don't get it because unfortunately cocaine has a different stigma than a lot of other drugs out there too, of cocaine's a safe drug. It's a party drug. It has a stigma of, you know, wealthy people do it. It's okay. People, you know, actors do it. It's, 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 that's all it is. It's, it's not like heroin. You don't see coke addicts doing rails underneath an overpass homeless. You see heroin addicts doing that. You see you know, fentanyl addicts doing that. You don't necessarily even see alcoholics doing that. And so I love the type of people that I talked to because they were my kind of people. I, I got them and they got me. Um, and so that's where my passion and sharing really came from. And one of the things that I became passionate about is teaching others the difference between enabling and supporting. Um, and the reason that I became passionate in this and it, where she even found my, my role playing from is I have a salesman that used to work for me and my wife actually knew him that committed suicide, but, um, I helped him get his daughter sober and her name was Megan and Megan was addicted to heroin and we got her sober and it was a process. It was, it was a process. Got her into the Red Cross, has a, or not the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, excuse me, has a um, really good rehab program, actually. Um, yes, I know they're not LGBTQ friendly. They're not. They, 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 they aren't. I'd be upfront about that, but I will say this. It's a free service. And if you want to live, put that shit aside right now because it's more about living than somebody saying, okay, I, I understand this aspect of life. Because now we're just talking about life and death. And so she finally was like, okay, because she was gay. Fucking went through it, got sober, created this beautiful life for herself. And she was at work and had back pain, complaining one day. And she took a Vicodin. And it's an opiate, instant relapse. Within a matter of a month, she was back to shooting up heroin. She lost her job, lost her girlfriend, lost her apartment. All this stuff was living back with her dad. And her dad kept calling me up and going, what do I do? What do I do? And I was like, you got to kick her out of the house. Stop giving her money, stop giving her alcohol. And he keep telling me all these things like, oh, I got to give her, you know, she's in pain and, you know, she has nowhere to sleep and all this. And I'm like, dude, it's not how it works. <laughs> and she ended up dying of a fentanyl overdose that was cut into co uh, heroin. And they found her dead in a uh, uh, strip mall parking lot. And it was one of those things that it goes to show of how much people don't understand the difference of enabling and supporting. And one of the hardest things is, and why I do like dealing with addicts so much, is addicts know this and don't know how to explain this to family, of that, this weird thing of, we can love our kids, we can love our spouse, we can love our parents, but we will never love them as much in the way that we do drugs. And nobody grasps this concept. We as addicts are not sane people. And why we love our drugs more is our drugs are safe. Our drugs aren't going to hurt us. A family member can hurt us. Even as an addict, you can hurt my feelings. You can hurt me. You can bring out emotions in me. You can do a lot. But my drugs never will. My drugs, if I, I know what I'm going to get when I do my drugs. It might take more. It might take less. But I know what this result is going to be. I find comfort in that. It doesn't lie to me. I know it's going to give me what I need it. I know it's going to make me feel good. It's always going to be a positive outcome. And I have now sold myself so much on that. These are on a different level than all my family is. And if my family starts to try and interject, I will lie, cheat, steal, manipulate. I'll tell my family whatever they want to hear to protect this more than anything else. And 
family members don't grasp that and get that a lot of times, unfortunately. Um, and so that's where I really started taking a passion in to sharing that aspect of it of, you know, one for addicts of how to get help, because a lot of times people don't realize like addicts have to want to get help and they want, have to want to get sober. Um, forcing an addict to get sober isn't, isn't necessarily going to do anything for them. Um, in fact, it probably is going to have a lot of negative side effects. Um, when it comes to we, we, our rock bottoms are different for everybody. The way that we get sober is different for everybody. Um, families don't realize, I think, the importance of therapy in it. Um, they don't realize the important, uh, you know, even with therapists out there, a lot of times the importance of, I will say this, without Adderall, I would be an addict still. And it's not that Adderall gives me this high and Adderall, any of that. I take Adderall and I have since I was 17, except when I was a raging addict. But I take 10 milligrams in the morning and I take 10 milligrams in the afternoon and I try to remember my meds every day and I have alarms set to remind me because I forget a lot of times. Not a huge priority. But if I don't take them for a couple days, I notice that I'm kind of flaky in my head and I'm all over the board. But when I am focused and my brain is functioning as it should be, I'm not looking for ways to slow my brain down. I'm not looking for a medicated, how do I stop this thought process? Um, and that was one of my biggest challenges is when I was a, a raging addict of that helped self-medicate me. And so I think, you know, medication is important in some cases. I think therapy and trauma... Because I think we all start this because we are escaping something. Um, I think a lot of what happens with addiction is based off of the shit that we have that we don't know how to deal with. And biggest thing is, is we take a drug all of a sudden, we take something all of a sudden, it makes us forget all this shit that we're hiding. And it makes us feel good for once. So I'm just going to keep taking this because this is easy. It's the easy button. It's the easy way out. Uh, they're so easy to get. You know, no matter what it might be. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of education around um, addiction. And there's a lot of stigma around, I think, addiction because NA and AA aren't great education tools. Um, going into an NA class or AA, an ANA meeting, for example, you're not going to learn anything about addiction. You're just going to see the fucking nightmare reality side and go, God, these people are fucking sick. They should probably all be put down like dogs because you'll hear people talk about stories of, they're kicking from no Percocets for the last two days. Somebody finally gives them hydrocodone, which isn't Percocets, so they're going to double that up. They haven't ate anything, so they pop those. They now vomit, trying to eat food, picking Percocets out of vomit to swallow, or hydrocodone out of vomit, trying to swallow down some food to swallow them back down out of this vomit to get them into their system to get the kicks to stop. And people, normal people hear that and go... That ain't fucking right, man. And any addict that you hear, you hear somebody say that goes, fuck, dude, I totally relate, man. I've been there, and I, dude, this time, and we're sharing war stories because it helps us feel less alone and less insane and isolated. Um, and that's why I love it when anyone on the, the, the mental health side of things wants to learn about addiction because I don't think there's a lot of education done on addiction. So I think a lot of people, especially in recovery, are treated with a lot of stigmas. Um, which that alone, I think just hurts the whole thing of less and less resources for addicts to go to, or addicts to not be open about their addictions or to seek help or where to even find help at. Um, and I think it fucks a lot of people. I didn't want to just keep rambling in case there were some questions. <laughs> I just want to say real quick, um, Kate, and I saw you unmuted yourself. Give me a sec. Um, from the clinical perspective, right, being a provider that has worked in addiction for over 10 years, your story and what you're saying is so common. The romanticizing the substances, right? The substances go beyond any family member, kids, wife, parents, your, yourself, right? It goes way beyond that. Um, and, and that you said what you said about, we're going to talk about it in, in lecture today. We were saying about AA and NA and they're not educating you, right? They're, it's just, we're 
circling the drain and the shit of our war stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I personally have some, you know, thoughts on that, but I'm glad you said it. Yeah, no, it, it is one of those things too. I think in a, I think everybody gets sober differently. Mm-hmm. And so I'm for everything. I don't think NA and A you have to do to get sober um, by any means. Um, they're very heavily religion based, and there are people out there that aren't heavily religion based, and that's cool. Um, the only thing I will say that I will always give it credit for is at least it gets addicts together so that you're not alone. Because that's our worst enemy is when we're alone, you know, and we get fucking bored easily, especially when we first get sober. Kate, did you? Yeah, I guess um, you mentioned that for a while you were like very high functioning addict. Um, and I guess I'm curious what advice you would have for people who have like high functioning addicts in their life who are pretty in denial that there's a problem, like how to support them because i know you also mentioned that like you know forcing people into treatment doesn't really is really counterproductive so like i don't know feels like a bit of a tug of war there i think it is a major tug of war and it is the roughest part is functioning alcoholics and functioning addicts because you can call them out and i will say this as a functioning addict i knew i was a functioning addict i knew but i would lie and the easiest thing I always found to do, especially later on, is just call people out and be like, hey, I get it that you're not ready to be sober. I get it that you're not there, but you're a fucking addict, dude. And I hope one day that you can admit to it. And I would just be, there was no, I found that there was no gray area. If you were black and white, that connected differently with addicts. And even if you're, the closer that you are to somebody, the harder it is. And if you want somebody to actually call somebody out for you or to make a difference and an impact, has to be a neutral player. Because as an addict, we will listen to a customer who says we smell like alcohol or somebody else in our life that we don't really know you that starts to call us out a little bit on addiction or on use of, dude, you seem like you're high on coke or something. That hits us different because you don't know me. You can't hurt me. You're seeing something. I already know I'm an addict. Oh, fuck. And it hits a lot different than what a family member does. Because as a family member, we just put our guards right back up and we're going to lie. Get around this however we can. We'll never look at you and be like, oh, you're right. Good call. You called me out on that one. Way to go. We just won't because we have to deny this to the very end. Because if we admit it, then we're admitting that we're an addict. And then we're we're fucked. And then all of a sudden you're probably not going to loan us the money that we need or make our life a little bit easier, which helps enable our focus towards our addiction. So finding neutral parties who are more prone to, or even family friends who aren't super close to lend their support and, you know, just bring it up around somebody of like, hey, dude, it looks like you're struggling a little bit with this, what's going on, and to at least keep continually bringing up the conversation, you hold, I think, a higher percentage chance that the people will actually be open with them because I can tell you all the shit and you're not, you're not a direct threat to me. Where a family member is, you're, this is, this is too close to me. You're not as close. That's why one of the worst things I think you can do is when you are getting sober is lean on family member at, family members as your support because you can't be real with family members. They, they're, it's too close. But I can, be, I can be honest with another addict who I don't know very well and be like, dude, fucking today's hard, man. I, I fucking slipped up today. I went down and I, I fucking... I fucking bought a rock and I got fucking high and I realized what I did and fuck, dude, I'm, I'm fighting it now. I haven't used since then. Like I can be honest with this person. They're not going to per se judge me where if I told a family member this, oh, fuck, it's a whole different story. <laughs> so I think that's why it's so important to utilize people who aren't that close to an addict, if that makes sense. But it's the hard, it's the hardest one ever when you... When somebody is a functioning addict. (laughs) 
Jennifer, can you talk a little bit about the role plays and kind of your mission and your goal and even maybe if you want to like demonstrate yeah. and the skills that you use there? So the, the role playing that I do is to help people set boundaries and to realize what boundaries are. And there's things I've mentioned in all of these. And one big one that I always mention is al -Anon. I think al is extremely important. It's almost more important than AA and NA because al you get a bunch of non-addicts that have addicts in their lives together to be able to tell their war stories to grab a better understanding and comprehension because non-addicts, especially when you have a either a functioning addict um, or a full-blown just fucking call what it is a junkie addict whatever you want to like full-blown addict um the family members and the people in their lives need need support you need therapy you need support too and elanon is a great resource for that and so it's learning and setting up a lot of those healthy boundaries and what if found is a lot of times with family excuse me one of the two family members has a different both parents have different relationships like with kids and i always use it as a as a kid's example in a lot of the things that I'll do because I get a lot of kids who will reach out how do I help parents or parents reach out how do I help kids and it ultimately just comes down to these boundaries so what I found is your, your best fighting chance to really help an addict is interventions don't work so I'll never do role plays on interventions interventions you have cornered in somebody into a corner they'll and, and at a certain point yeah addict may say you know me as an addict have you fucking intervened with me I fucking hate you all now. Now I'm going to do whatever is in my power to lie and hide even better because fuck this and fuck you all. I will agree with everything because I got to make this fucking stop real quick and I'm going to bail on it the first second I get. That's the reality of it. And now fuck you all because now you're my enemy. Now you want to hurt me. You want to steal my fucking addiction away from me. And the worst part about it too is people who are doing the interventions, these kids live in their fucking house. These kids are eating at the fucking table. And, and reality is, is you're, you, those parents need a fucking intervention because that is full on enabling. And I get it, man. I get it. It's your kid. But I've also been to so many funerals where it is the parents burying their fucking kids. So I'd rather have a, be a parent if it was me. And I've watched this work with a lot of parents where they've taken that risk. And instead of burying their kid, they got to have a relationship again with them later on. But it was literally, even for me as an addict and from my story, my final healing took place when my mom said, fuck you, no more fucking money, no more fucking help, don't ever fucking call me again. And I went, oh, fuck, this is the real shit. Like, my mom has now finally dropped me. Fuck. Like, she always enabled me. I was always poor me, poor Eeyore. I was the fucking victim because that is what we as an addict are. We're always the victim. That's one of our big manipulation tactics. So having these firm boundaries prevents all this. So, you know, el for those, I'll always mention, and I always pr pretend like, hey, the wife won't, you know, mom won't come to the door and talk with you right now. She's not strong enough for it. And that's the thing I think for some parents to realize is it's, it's one of those addicts, we are the most clever and we will play everybody against each other. And when it comes to families, you have one person that communicates with the addict and that is it. Because if I can get multiple people playing my little game, I can manipulate and get whatever I want. Now, if I'm only talking to one person constantly, I can't manipulate this one person. This one person is the, the black and white all of a sudden. Now I'm fucked. So that's why I'll always have it be, hey, I'm, there's one person who will come and talk to you. And the thing when it comes to boundaries and it comes to support versus enabling you know, a kid comes to your house and they're a fucking addict living under the street or wherever they're hungry, you know, oh, you're always going to have food and feed them. Don't let an addict into your house, though, even if it's your fucking kid, don't let them in your house. You have to set a firm boundary of leaving them outside and people are like, well, that's really fucking harsh. Why would you ever do that? Do you know what it's like to get a kid out of your house that's going through withdrawals? Who is stealing your shit now, kicking in the fucking doors, fucking kicking in the walls, breaking everything to the point that you don't want to touch them because they will grab a knife and slice you to now you're calling the cops on your kids to get the cops to try and remove the kid out of your fucking house. Good luck with that one. Parents don't see that though. And people don't see that side of it. That's the, the, the sickness side of addiction. I know what it's like to, to talk to parents and go, yeah, I let my kid in the house and they left and I realized my whole fucking jewelry box is missing. 
because they went inside and stole all the shit, took it down to the pawn shop so they could keep getting fucking high. And parents keep doing the definition of insanity of letting them in the house thinking it's going to be different next time, and it's not. So I will always be play the whole thing of, you know, you're only talking to one, you're, you're, you're outside, you don't come inside. That's the rule. And you can sit outside for as long as you want. I will always give you food, I'll always give you water. I'll never give you money because money is the biggest enabler of all. You don't give money, you don't give gift cards because gift cards have a street value too. You give nothing of value because anything of value somebody will take and use to flip to get money to use. I mean, that's the bottom line. So, you know, yeah, I'll give you underwear, I'll give you socks, I'll give you toothbrush and toothpaste. This stuff has no street value, but it actually has value if you're homeless. And that's as far as my love and my extent will go for you. I'll make sure you have you have warm clothes. But that's all I can do because I, if I do anything more, I'm now going to start enabling you and you're going to find some way to flip it so that you can find another reason to use. And doing this, I take away more and more of the excuses for you to use. And when an addict realizes, and, and a, like with rock bottom is, and for most addicts that I've talked to when we've actually hit rock bottom, is when everybody has left you. And that is the dark place in addiction is when you are truly alone. You can't call anyone anymore. Because addicts don't trust other addicts. You're not trusting anyone else around you. And that's the only real fighting chance you have to hopefully maybe somebody does get, does roll over in the fucking box or whatever one night and go, fuck, I don't want this life anymore because that's what I essentially had to do. And go, what's the fucking common denominator here? Wow, cocaine, alcohol, me. Fuck, maybe if I change this, it will all get different. I won't repeat this cycle. And so that is the huge thing that is that straightness between the boundaries and, and to the um, supporting. And again, you know, as a parent, if, if a kid wants to go to rehab, dude, I always offer it up there and always be like, hey, if you want to go to rehab, dude, I'll take you. Uh, it's always a solution. I'm not going to force you to go, but if you want to go and you decide, fuck, I really need help, fuck, dude, let's jump in the truck. I'll take you to rehab. But I'm also not going to be like, hey, you're getting in the fucking truck. I'm taking you to rehab because it's not going to work. It has to be, it has to be our idea. Um, and that's where, you know, a lot of it is, is educating and learning of what this, what this sickness almost is. Um, and learning that, you know, people struggle, is it a disease? And why is it labeled a disease? And it's a lot of, you can, uh, you can pay attention to brains and how they develop at a young age. And you can, you can determine a little bit of who probably is going to be an addict and who won't. Um, because of what, what drugs can offer, what, what massive amount of dopamine and all that can offer somebody. But in these role plays, I, I think it's really important that you keep it black and white because as an addict, all of our stuff is a sales show. We're always in trouble. We're always in pain. We're always hurting for money because we're gonna tug at everybody. You're tugging at parents' heartstrings. I can tell you from an addict, I want to make my parents fucking cry. I want to make you look at me and go, holy shit, dude, you're right. The world's fucking crumbling around you. Let me come in and just take care of you right now. Holy shit, dude, I love my fucking son. I love my daughter. I got to help them. So I will paint whatever picture that I am always the victim. Never my fault. No responsibility in anything. You don't fucking understand. I'm homeless. I'm going to get fucking beat up. I'm going to get fucking shanked. I'm going to get thrown in jail, whatever it might be. Scraping for anything so that you as a parent, because I know that you love me, fucking snap. And I will do whatever it takes to get you to snap. Because once you snap, now I can get whatever I need from you. And guess what? It's always in the same story. Yep, fucking kid took me for another one. What do you know? Kid took me for a fucking another one, man. I'm, I'm a thousand bucks out. Because <laughs> we're always never paying rent. We're always don't have any food. We always... Um, you know, don't have a phone, all this stuff, always, always, always. And when you, when you finally realize that and you keep it black and white, it makes it a lot simpler, I think, to navigate. You talked earlier about like your experience with Adderall, um, I guess, being in graduate school, that's something I think a lot about because it can be so powerful, but it's abused so easily in like the academic world. 
and like in in many ways it is really necessary and it prevents people from self-medicating but it also you know can it is like it's an amphetamine you know Mm -hmm. it's really easily abused I guess I'm curious about like your perspective specifically on like prescription drugs and sort of like how that can like I don't know I feel like it makes it I feel like people can be more in denial that it's like an addiction because it's a prescription that a doctor can give you and not something you're getting off the street yeah Um, and I agree with that a thousand percent. I know what you're saying. And I I wanted to hear your side through because I'm always fascinated when somebody asks this because I even get the same thing. This is actually one of the struggles I have with NA, for example. Um, I've been to different NA meetings and people will tell me that I'm not sober because I'm on amphetamine salts. I'm like, okay, well, methamphetamine is different than amphetamine salts. There's a different molecule. It passes methyl pass through a brain blood barrier where Adderall will not. So it hits our brain a little differently, but methamphetamine is actually prescribed. There's about 15,000 prescriptions a year through dioxin. I believe it's how it's pronounced, but it's an ADHD med and it literally on the bottle reads methamphetamine. Um, and it is one of those that it's this drug that people will, again, it's kind of glamorized like uh, cocaine is that it will make me smart, I will lose weight, I will study, I'm gonna be smarter, I'm gonna pass my class, I'm gonna stay up a little bit later, I'm gonna be energized, I'm gonna have all these wonderful effects. And if you're not ADHD, you do get some of those wonderful effects. Me as ADHD, if I want to actually take a nap, I have to make sure I've taken Adderall because that's the only way I can slow my brain down. If I try to take a nap, I will lay in bed and come up with a thousand different projects. I'm exhausted now because there's 15 projects I just started in my head. Didn't do it. I'm still in bed. Now I failed because I didn't finish these pro. I mean, I like, literally that's how my thought process works. This calms my brain down. So for those that aren't ADHD, here is this again. I think it is unfortunately pushed more to the medical field of how do we diagnose people with ADHD and actually let these meds out? When I got diagnosed with ADHD, I got diagnosed, I had to meet with a psychologist. I met with a psychiatrist. I had like two different written tests. I had a verbal test that I had to do with a psych. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't go in 30 minutes later, come out, go, oh, you're ADHD. Here's a prescription of Adderall. Mine was a process. We don't do that anymore. It's the easy way out. Everyone's just in and out, turn and burn them. Uh, insurance that's how you know they're gonna pay for 30 minutes and I need to have some kind of result afterwards whatever I think it's important to educate people the side effects of it because the worst part is is I got on Adderall in the late 90s 97 98 and that was kind of the miracle drug people didn't know a lot about it and I'm fucked and I tell people that I'm not an addict to it per se I the difference, I think, between addiction and dependency is, is as an addict, if I was addicted to Adderall, I have, I'd burn through all my Adderall. I would never be able to keep Adderall on me. I'd be constantly chewing it like, you know, Skittles. But if I don't take it, within a week, I go through withdrawals. I go through mental withdrawals. I go through physical withdrawals. And the withdrawals of Adderall fucking suck. Um, and people aren't aware of what fully those withdrawals are. And we have built a stigma around it of that it's not going to hurt you. And there's not a lot of people that speak out about Adderall. And it's such a fine line that there's not a lot of doctors that get involved in this conversation, which is what I think hurts it so much. Is you literally have addicts trying to explain how Adderall can be a drug and cannot be a drug for some or a drug of choice. Versus the those who know nothing really about addiction saying, well, no, it's an amphetamine salt, same as crystal meth, you're a fucking addict. So you're no one's ever presented with the true facts of it. it, it when it comes to even opiates, no one's presented with the facts of even when you prescribe opiates of, hey, by the way, I'm going to prescribe you a hydrocodone for your hand. I'm going to prescribe you're going to take this for the next three weeks. You're probably going to be addicted to them. 
you're going to go through very minor withdrawals. And these are what to expect through these withdrawals. You're going to have the shakes. You're going to feel, you know, constipated. You're going to have trouble sleeping. You're going to have restless legs. You're going to feel all this. Could be a little major. Could be a little minor. It's going to fucking suck. This is your withdrawals. This is the time that we have to go through it. Tell me when it hits and we can even sometimes find a program to help through it. Doctors don't tell patients that. They take their perc or hydrocodone for the three weeks. They start going through withdrawals. First thing that also hits is pain because my endorphins now are bonded to that, my pain receptors. So now I'm in massive pain. I don't think that I've healed. Calling up my doctor for quick fix is just calling another prescription. And we don't bring patients back in and sit them down and find out, are you going through withdrawals right now or not? And that's how I've, I've learned a lot of people have gotten hooked to pain pills same kind of way even with Adderall and, and Ritalin, is you're not aware of what these withdrawal signs are. Um, and both have these, these different things to it. I mean, the most abused um, prescription pills out there, number one is Oxy, number two is Xanax, number three is Adderall, Ritalin, and then it's Vicodin. Those are the five top prescribed um, abused prescription pills. And so I think a lot of it comes into you know, educating kids about this at even a young age that we don't do because we don't talk about any of this shit. We put a demand on grades. We put a demand on performance. We want you to be the best at sports, but don't use steroids. We want you to be the best at school, but you don't even hear people say, don't use fucking Adderall <laughs> unless you fucking ADHD. Um, that is where I think the biggest problem is and why we'll always have a pill epidemic in a sense. And it's gotten worse. I mean, that's why we have the Adderall shortages. People don't realize the Adderall shortages are is they've written too many prescriptions for Adderall. And there's only so many prescriptions a year that the U.S. government allows me wrote for it. And when the when the um, when COVID hit, everyone's just getting fucking diagnosed at home. Oh, man, you're having trouble studying. Yeah, it's really hard. Online classes, fuck. It must be ADHD. Here's some Adderall. That'll help you. Here's some Ritalin. That'll help you. It's actually diagnosing somebody and explaining to people and explaining to parents, too, of putting your kids on these, these meds. This is, what, this is what the outcome could be. Because I can tell you this, as, as a 43-year-old as a right now that is dependent on Adderall, Yes, it's a lifesaver. It's the biggest tool in my toolbox that has helped me be everything in life. And if I could go back in time, I would say if there was a non-stimulant addictive pill out there, let's look at that first. And let me trial and error with that because doctors are more likely to trial and error me with higher and lower doses of Adderall or take me from Adderall to Vyvanse or from Adderall to Adderall XR than they are to what non-stimulant meds are out there not possibly to put you on. And that's where I think it's a lot of it actually falls onto the medical field and into what we are doing with kids to actually making a change to that. Otherwise, we're not going to see a change, if that makes sense. I don't know if that fully answers your question because I think it's just one of those questions that we're just fucked on. <laughs> No, that definitely answered my question. I think it's it's hard because, like, it can be a very powerful tool. Like, it's you said it's helped you a lot, and, like, it's helped a lot of people with ADHD, but then you do become, in a way, dependent on it. And I've had that experience with, like, antidepressants, too. It's just not something that we're taught. Like, I remember the first time I went through withdrawal from my antidepressants, I thought I had the flu. I was shaking. I was vomiting. I couldn't like regulate my body temperature and it took weeks for me to realize, Oh, I forgot to take my meds. That's mm. what it is. And it's like, you do become like biologically linked and it, it isn't an addiction like you were saying, but it's complicated because you do need it. Yeah. You're, you're dependent on it, but you don't, it's not getting you high. It's not giving, it's not feeding this hole in your chest and bringing out this happiness, this whole other beast. It's not doing any of that. But if you don't take it, you're going through withdrawals and it doesn't make sense. And that is the one thing that I don't think any parents are educated on it, especially. They just find it as this quick fix pill. 
you know, as a, as a doctor, you can tell a parent, hey, this is going to make your kid smarter. This is going to help your kid out in class. He's not going to be skipping class. And if you're only telling somebody the benefits of it, yeah, of course it makes sense. And that's where the problem in lies is nobody, yeah, you'll put warning labels on the pill case and on the, the bottle, but you're not going to tell people truly what the dangers are. And oh, by the way, after about 30 days, your kid's probably a fucking addict. And I guarantee you, if a doctor looked at a parent and said, okay, you want us to put your kid on, uh, on Xanax because he's a fucking nervous mess or whatever, instead of really breaking it down, getting the kid into the right therapy, finding out maybe is it home issues, what is it? Oh, wow, your parents are actually screaming and no wonder why you have fucking mad anxiety or whatever is all this. Instead of that, we tell the parents, hey, you know, let's put him on, you know, low dose of Xanax and that's going to just cure it all. He won't have any anxiety. He'll still have energy. He's not going to be sleepy. And I could sell this drug to you as this miracle drug. Great. Okay. That sounds awesome. But if you also looked at the parent probably and said, okay, after 30 days, your kid's a fucking addict, by the way. And by the way, this addiction is so serious because it's a benzo that it's going to affect his central nervous system. That when we, he withdraws off this, there is a chance your kid's going to die. You're cool with that though, right? Parent might think a little differently, but it, it's never portrayed that way. Why don't we portray and share both sides of the reality of it? You know what I mean? And that's where I think we do it to ourselves. I guess sort of with that, I know you talked a lot about like trauma and abandonment issues when you were telling your story. Do you think like getting into therapy at a young age could have like changed the course of things for you? I was in therapy at a young age. Oh, okay. I think... Having therapists almost to me is one of the most respected fields there is. But getting a kid to truly open up and understand your feeling, because I think the biggest problem that we run into, and I know me when I was like 13 and 14, I didn't know how to communicate with a therapist like, hey, I don't feel like I'm hurt at home or I don't feel like I'm respected at home. I didn't know how to communicate these emotions and feelings and stuff that I, I feel. So that was difficult. I also found, you know, I was always that fear of getting in trouble by my parents. So I also learned to lie to therapists and that everything was always okay. Everything was great. Um, sometimes on the flip side, I found if I made a big deal about something, it gave me attention. It gave me love. All I wanted was attention. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to communicate with a therapist of, Hey, how do I go up to my mom and dad and say, Hey, I really need some love right now. Like, can I give you guys both a hug and maybe we can watch a movie tonight? Like, it'd be really, really important to me. And this would be really nice. And it would probably put me in a really good mood. Didn't know how or to, to ever learn to communicate that with them. But I did learn if I hit myself or I fucking lost my shit and fucking freaked out that it would give me attention. And usually positive attention. So maybe I, I just, I, but that works, that's simple, that's easy, okay, I can do that. You know, I, there's no way to navigate through that. And so I think that was the biggest problem as a kid going through therapy is really learning to communicate what we feel and what we're lacking and what we need. And that's where I think it blurs so much when it comes to like mental health and why people self-harm. Because yes, I think there's people that, that cut themselves for attention and I think there's people that do it because there is a release side to it. I've self-harmed before. I know what it's like to burn myself with a lighter because I'm so fucked up that I just need to feel something so I know I'm alive. I mean, that's how fucked in the head I was. So people do it all for these different reasons. But even when people claim they're suicidal versus, you know, are they doing it just for attention or are they truly suicidal and asking for help? is we're never taught how to communicate and we're not we're, we're if it gives you the result that you're looking for you just default to that if that makes sense so as a kid yeah i learned i learned how to manipulate the system really easily in the beginning because it wasn't anyone's fault per se it was just the fact of i'm talking to a really intelligent doctor or whatever and maybe it wasn't connecting fully with them that hey how do i tell my parents that this is something that's really important to me. And maybe if we did this all together, it would just make me happy. 
and it's okay for me to be happy sometimes. <laughs> so I, I think that's, that's where a lot of it comes from. Um, I think therapy at a young age is important, but it's just teaching your kids how to communicate with a therapist and your kids how to communicate, I think is, is key because it's more than just speaking, it's comprehending and retaining and validating. It's so much that goes into communication uh, that we don't realize. And that's where the only way that therapy worked for me, especially this last time around, is I had to promise myself I wasn't going to lie to my therapist. I wrote down, what do I want out of therapy? And I sat down with her ass and said, okay, her name is Susan. Susan, you're the third therapist I've seen. I'm trying to find the right fucking therapist. This is what I'm struggling with. My, my girlfriend uh, just broke up with me. I'm repeating the same cycle as I did when I was an addict. I'm five years sober. I haven't used or done anything, but I still have a lot of these same processes. So I don't know if it's self-sabotaging, what the fuck it is. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what I need help with. Here is my story. And just went from fucking there and was just completely open. The next thing I learned, I have no fucking self-worth. I don't know how to even really look in the mirror and look at myself and go, wow, I actually like who I see. Had to break it down to the ridiculous, but I never got would get there unless I was actually for once finally honest and and wanted help. Like I have to, you have to want to have help when you're going to therapy. Or do you want just somebody to talk to? If you want somebody just to talk to, I think that's fine too. We all need that. But like tell the therapist at least like, hey, I just need somebody to fucking vent to. I'm not going to get anything out of this. I'll get something out of it because I got it out, but that's it. But, you know... I think that's the, the only way it really helps so much further down the road of even staying off of drugs and staying off of this shit. Because, you know, you if you go onto social media, the worst one is you go onto the fentanyl kills one. You see all these fentanyl overdoses. And people don't realize how kids OD on fentanyl. If it's cut in a pill, because you can go buy pill presses, pill presses are super cheap. Anybody who's using a pill press is probably at a trap house. And if you've ever seen a trap house, it is one of the most disgusting things you've ever seen. No one in their right mind would, would, would even want to step into one because, I mean, it, it's that fucking disgusting. And they'll get a little bit of fentanyl and that goes a long way. Well, nobody is a master. Nobody's a chemist there. So you crush it all up and you're blending it together as good as you can. No idea what the percentage is in any of this. And you're just popping it all through a pill press. <laughs> And so you see these kids that, you know, you're like, God, man, that's horrible. How did this wonderful little girl who looks like that has a great life and God, her dad is fucking sobbing because she died from fentanyl and fentanyl kills, hashtag fentanyl kills. Okay, did you teach the, the kid of, hey, you don't have to worry about fitting in because guess how kids die from OD and kids get hooked at a young age is peer pressure isn't what the fucking D.A.R.E. program and all this stuff taught us of what peer pressure is. Peer pressure is your friends to me. Dude, this is awesome. Dude, just here, take this real quick, man. Get, fucking, you're going to enjoy this. Not even question because it's their friends and you trust them. So you fucking pop it and now you're fucking dead. Hurrah. I mean, that's that's the reality of it, though. Is we don't teach kids what it's truly like versus what it is in a textbook. And they're not the same. Um, and so, I mean, that's... That's this messed up, fucked up side with drugs and addiction to what you can actually do. Is it preventable? Yeah, I think you can make a huge difference in it. But I think it takes parents, I think it takes, you know, medical professionals to almost follow this thing of the, of the reality of where we're at right now as society. And being real with people and letting them know, hey, you, you know, the kid that's going to fucking die from this is the kid that... All their friends are doing it. They're just going to do it too. They really don't even know what they're taking. Family found out because they did an autopsy and they told them it was fentanyl. And oh my God, dude, fentanyl fucking kill. Yeah, it does kill, but how'd your kid get fentanyl? Drug cartels aren't at fucking high schools. The drug drug dealers aren't at fucking high schools. So then you have to break it all down to the ridiculous. And that's how kids get Adderall. That's how kids get, you know, all these, these, that's why through high school is the easiest thing to find are pills. In college, the easiest thing to find are pills. College students can't afford Coke. <laughs> Can barely afford classes sometimes. So if you do get Coke, it's probably white powder stuff that's pretty cut up. It's not the yellowish scaly shit that's not cut. 
Um, and so that's what filters into those places. Um, but no, I, it's um, the only way I think you can ever combat prescription pills is by, if I circle back even to that, is by telling the reality of the, that, hey, you will be an addict. I mean, after 30 days, 90% you're an addict. Here's what the side effects are going to be, and here's what you're going to go through. Now you can make a conscious, logical decision if you want to do this or not. Because no one, I don't think, is given the choice, just like when it comes to taking a fentanyl pill, to make a logical decision. Do I want to take this? Because you're only telling me the good and you're not telling me the bad. So... Other questions, comments? Um, I had one. What you got? First of all, I, I want to say thank you for sharing your story. Um, and I just wanted to know if you had any any goals like for the few, like where you would like to see the future for you beyond um or maybe staying with like the role playing or if you have any aspirations um my aspirations have flipped back to my wife and i own a an app and stuff and that does really well like i want to i don't want to work in five years i want to do this for five more years and, and be done i want to do one i want to do a book because when i had done this all back in the day i've always wanted to do a book um about how to actually grieve and how to go through a lot of this stuff. Um, and I just enjoy speaking and sharing and making a difference um, to the point that I'm still 50-50 if I wanna actually do and put together my own rehab or not, um, because it is something I'd be, I have started toying with the idea of, um, but also mending it into social media along with, um, an app and multiple facets to it where it's not just one dimensional like a lot of rehabs are um, and not as based as heavily around insurance money and based more around like social media money which is essentially free money so you can essentially help more people <laughs> um, and so that's where I kind of want to see all this go so I've given it five years to to see what ends up happening and I've started enjoying doing a lot more talking and presenting with it because I just, I love the addiction side of it because I watch it, the, the addiction, the addiction side of stuff gets just, it just keeps growing. <laughs> it's not getting any better. And it's like, there's just so many people out there struggling with it. And it's like, dude, if you can help one person, just it makes you feel a little bit better. You paid it forward. And uh, I think that's one of the important things about it. So that's where I see it. I have one more question. Uh -huh. um, and this is just out of curiosity. What is your opinion of Measure 110? What is Measure 110? Um, decriminalizing substances in... So, because uh, I, I want to make sure I'm clear on this one, because I... I, I so it's decriminalizing all substances, though, to a certain weight or percentage, right? It's like personal personal use substances. I mean, if you are, you know, selling or distributing, that's mm -hmm. different. But personal use substances, um, heroin, methamphetamines, cocaine, all of that and all, all of those. Right. So my view on this is that is the stupidest fucking thing in the world. But here is my, my view on it. But I also see the point of it. And this is, again, where we get, where society is, as a whole, even the United States as a whole, is not on board. Take Kratom, for example. Kratom is not illegal in any of the states except for five states out there. In five states out there, it's a Schedule, I think it's a Schedule 1 drug. It's the same as heroin. They literally have scheduled it the same as heroin. So you go into, I want to say... It's like Arkansas is one of the states. And don't, don't quote me, but I know it's two southern states and it's like three northern states. And I almost positive New Hampshire is one of them also. So say you go into Florida and you buy 
you know, a pound of fucking red kratom. You go into fucking Arkansas, you get pulled over. You're slapped with a fucking drug trafficking charge. And they don't tell you it's kratom. You're slapped with a drug trafficking charge. So now juries, everybody else, they're thinking you're a Schedule 1 drug. Oh, that's heroin. They're not thinking it's some fucking thing that's legal the next state over. So this is where I think it convolutes everything. Like with weed, some of these substances, um, psychedelics are known to have positive effects to, you know, depression when it comes to ketamine. Um, I've microdosed before, and I can tell you microdosing shrooms, yep, took away all my depression, took away all my anxiety. I mean, I did have a side effect with it, which was I was pretty lethargic, so I did, wasn't very motivated, which sucked. So I was like, yep, doesn't not really my thing, whatever. But didn't go through any withdrawals to it. There's no, there's not a lot of, of education on, you know, true long-term effects of all this. So it's like, okay, so shrooms and these psychedelics are in, you legalize weed, but then you're going to make, you know, heroin illegal. What makes it where you can make heroin illegal and not these other substances? What differentiates them? And I think that's where, again, it has to almost be black and white. And you have to be a country united against drugs um, and go, you know, with the best information that you have, say this is what's illegal and this is what's not illegal. Because legalizing heroin, I think Portland's done the best example of it. They're, they are the proof that this does not work. And I, I've been to Portland a couple times this past year even. And I, I, you're walking on the street and everybody's in the corner with the nod going. And you're looking at their, their feet and they have foil all down by their feet. And you're like, yeah, you guys are fucked up. But cops aren't going to do anything about it. What do you do to help these people? Well, it obviously doesn't work that they call and they get a ticket. And if they, they go to this rehab and they do the program, they don't have to pay the fine and all this. So why would you enable people to find another excuse just to have heroin and fentanyl and all this on them? Like, nobody on their right mind is going to have fentanyl on them unless you're fucking, you're a cancer patient and you're dying. You know what I mean? Uh, that's the way at least that I look at it. And in the wrong hands, this is a drug that makes a lot of money. So now you're kind of, where do we go with it? Um, so my, my best thing is, is that you, you do, you, you look at the, the studies of everything. And from what I've seen, we... I would make it legal personally. I would make psychedelics legal. And, and that's, I'm talking like shrooms, ketamine, that, kratom. I think kratom's very dangerous, but I'd still make it legal uh, because all the states seem to think that it should be except for four. But you look at the big ones like, that are the big money makers that are the ones that, that have the biggest impact of like cocaine, heroin, um, you know, all this, and you just you keep them illegal. Because if you allow, if you allow and acknowledge that it's okay for people to have a little bit on it, all you're doing is sending the subconscious message that this shit isn't that dangerous. And as an addict, that just gives me more reinforcement. It makes me even bolder to use and just enables me to use even more. <laughs> so, I mean, that's my opinion on it. I would like to add to to the decriminalization and I'm not very familiar with measure 110. Um, but in general, I, one of the main concerns that at least a lot of clinicians have with decriminalization is the lack of the, like the systemic support, right? Um, it's okay. We decriminalize it, but are we going to increase the number of treatment centers? Are we going to increase the number of detox beds? Is the system going to hold all those people now? Where we are right now, no, right? Mm -hmm. But ideal that I think that's that would be the goal that we do kind of like the Portugal model, even though it hasn't been perfect, right? We see now that Portugal has had their issues, but it does have have its benefits. But I think it has to come from a systemic perspective of supporting the individual. I agree with you on that a, a, a huge percent because it's the we there is no infrastructure for it. And the, the reality is if you ask a lot of the lawmakers and people who are pro this stuff, are you okay with your kid being able to get heroin? 
Because that's essentially, you have to play all roles of it. So you're, you're cool with your kid being able to go somewhere where heroin's going to be easily available. I mean, it's already easy. At, I always make fun in a lot of my videos that, yeah, I could go to the uh, grocery store right now. I guarantee I could go to any grocery store around me. I have four of them. I could find probably four or five different type of opiates I could buy. Sure, I could find some benzos. Pretty sure I could easily find Xanax. Almost positive on that. Easily just buy alcohol, which is a drug anyhow. Kratom's legal here. And I could easily find Coke and I could easily find meth. I know that. I'd probably have to dig a little bit because I'm in a nicer area to find heroin. But these are at grocery stores. And this is a reality of it. I mean, there's been a part of me that's almost wanted to do videos that was a challenge. But then how do you not get essentially the people in trouble? Because you you literally find these people. But to like go into a store and literally be able to find people who you would be able to hook up so easily finding these drugs. Because I don't think people realize already how easily available they are to make them even easier to get. Anything else? So Eric, my last question that I ask all our guest speakers is, what advice do you have for future clinicians, right? So these, this is the future of psychology here, of mental health in this room, future doctors. How can these future doctors be really, really good clinicians to your population, right? To addicts, to people who are doing this work. What advice do you have for them? Realize how sick they are. And I mean that because as a doctor, and I'll just use this in this is for fun. I don't mean any harm by this, but as a doctor, your brain functions different than especially an addict's brain. Because an addict's brain is more animated, not very black and white, not very calculated, not very smart in some ways, very creative in a lot of ways that you have to really realize how insane we, we truly are. And it's almost that we don't want to be this insane, but we don't know any better because it calms us and it brings us this comfort and this warmth and this happiness and everything we thought that it should be able to bring us as it destroys our lives and realize truly how sick we are and that somebody who wants to be sober, somebody who truly wants to be sober, and this is where I think the worst is, is sober people get the worst blunt of the stigma that, you know, I've always been honest with my therapist because I've moved from California, like to Idaho. And I even told my therapist up here, Hey, I'm a recovering cocaine addict, but here are my, here are the medications I've been on. And I went through all the medication gambits and why I've been on these meds. And I've never had a doctor fight me on them, thankfully. Um, because the only med I'm on now is Adderall. I was on uh, Xanax for a little while because I had mad panic attacks after my dad's suicide and I didn't want to relapse. But realize that, so since we are sober, that we literally put as much energy, if not more energy, into our sobriety than we did our addiction in staying sober. And how important that is actually for, for somebody who is a recovering addict. Um... That, that we literally place this on a higher pedestal than we do relationships, we do anything else because we know what happens if we use again. And so understanding that and having that kind of compassion and understanding, I think, makes a huge difference for addicts who are still in the beginning or, or people who are sober in the beginning stages who are really struggling, who are hit with a lot of those stigmas by doctors that aren't as educated to realizing, okay, this person's on Suboxone because they really don't want to do heroin anymore. They don't know how to get off. This is something that's working for them. So you know what, they're not under an overpass. They're not dying. They're not stealing. They're not killing people. They're not robbing banks. They're doing the best that they can. And so realizing that, hey, you know what? I get it. You're putting in this much energy and being that supportive front of just at least that understanding. Because we have the choice that, you know, as an active addict, we are super fucking sick. <laughs> I mean, that's that's probably my best best thing I could ever say. Because addicts hate doctors. Because if you, if you look and you actually, like, listen to a lot of addicts speak, addicts, 
even people who are sober, which is something that has to change, go after doctors. They're, they're literally like, fuck emergency room doctors and fuck this, you know. I went in and they thought I'm pill shopping and I'm sober. And, you know, they take a lot of pride in the fact that they're sober for a year or they're sober for six months and they're not killing themselves to get shot down by somebody who thinks they're better than them is how we always will take it. Because we're still the victims, especially in the beginning of sobriety. We're always the victims until we learn that we're not. And realizing that, hey, this person's really sick and they're coming out of a sickness. <laughs> um, I think is the most important thing that makes a big difference. Along with telling people the negative sides of medication. <laughs> yeah, I think an ethical physician, provider, psychologist, psychiatrist should always, you know, discuss the risk and the benefits of any treatment, right? Medi medication, therapy, whatever it is. Um, they should, but I've, I've never ran into that. Right, and that's why I was about to say, like, there's there's so many issues, Right. That's why I said an ethical one should do, right? Yeah. That's the ideal version. So um, so hopefully all the colleagues here today can commit to, to being good and ethical providers in the future. Yeah, no, definitely. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. She, sharing your story, just showing us what we need to do. I really, really appreciate you. No, oh, definitely. I really appreciate this. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And De we'll keep in touch. We'll talk very soon. Definitely. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Uh -huh. Bye. All right. That was fun. I actually enjoyed that. So thank you guys for joining that. I apologize. I know I didn't interact with this live at all. Um, this was literally something I had been talking to this professor about for a while. These are med students in Oregon. And, um, and that was actually a lot of fun. Like I've never done this for med students and that's what intrigued me to do it because I've never had medical professionals like interested in this. Um, thank you, Sam. I appreciate that. Um, thank you. Uh, my friend keeps telling me they can get sober without professional help, relapses every weekend and people usually will. Um, people usually will relapse every weekend. People will always, I, I notice most people will always relapse. Um, not every weekend, but they'll relapse like every paycheck. That's the shitty part about it. <laughs> you guys, I appreciate that. Thanks. All right. I got to get um, going on the rest of my day. Uh, that was actually longer than I thought it was. I am actually going to post this whole thing on um, YouTube. But uh, I will... Uh, I got clean on my own after a long time, but it only lasts about a year. Yeah. I mean, I know people that got clean on their own time in their own way, and it's lasted for, for long times. I just, I think it's really, really important to, I think it's really important to want it is, is the hardest thing I, I can say is that you really got to want it and having that support. How do you trust an addict? Can it tell you can test them. Um, you can trust an addict by, over time, I think. You have to see, I think, Ivy, a massive change in their patterns. Addicts, we as addicts are very pattern driven because it's all around getting high and getting drunk and getting fucked up. That's why I can always make fun and say, hey, it's, you know, you'll watch people get fucked up um, and they'll get, they want to get sober after every payday because they just went on a bender, blew all their money, and now they, they, they need to get sober. But once they get paid again, then it changes again.